Chapter 78 The smallest hope a bear continuing to exist is enough for the anti-hero's future. Leave him, says our age, leave him where mankind is in its history, at a crossroads, in a dilemma, with all to lose and only more of the same to win. Let him survive, but give him no direction, no reward, because we too are waiting in our solitary rooms where the telephone never rings, waiting for this girl, this truth, this crystal of humanity, this reality lost through imagination, to return and to say she returns is a lie. But the maze has no center. An ending is no more than a point in sequence, a snip of the cutting shears. Benedict kissed Beatrice at last, but ten years later, and Elsinore, the following spring. So ten more days, but what happened in the following years shall be silence, another mystery. Ten more days in which the telephone never rang. Instead, on the last day of October, all Hallow's Eve, Kemp took me for a Saturday afternoon walk. I should have suspected such an uncharacteristic procedure, but it happened that it was a magnificent day with a sky from another world's spring, as blue as a delphinium petal, the trees russet and amber and yellow, the air still as in a dream. Besides, Kemp had taken to mothering me. It was a process that needed so much compensatory bad language and general gruffness that our relationship was sergeant-majored into something outwardly the very reverse of its true self. Yet it would have been spoiled if we had declared it, if we had stopped pretending that it did not exist. And in a strange way this pretending seemed an integral part of the affection. Not declaring we liked each other showed a sort of mutual delicacy that proved we did. Perhaps it was Kemp who made me feel happier during those ten days. Perhaps it was an aftermath of Jojo, least angelic of angels, but sent by hazard from a better world into mine. Perhaps it was simply a feeling that I could wait longer than I had still then imagined. Whatever it was, something in me changed. I was still the butt, yet, in another sense, conscious his truths, especially the truth he had embodied in Lily, matured in me. Slowly I was learning to smile, and in the special sense that conscious intended. Though one can accept and still not forgive, and one can decide and still not enact the decision. We walked north across the Euston Road and along the outer circle into Regent's Park. Kemp wore black slacks and a filthy old cardigan and an extinguished woodbine, the last as a sort of warning to the fresh air that it got through to her lungs only on a very temporary sufferance. The park was full of green distances, of countless scattered groups of people, lovers, families, solitaries with dogs, the colors softened by the imperceptible mist of autumn as simple and pleasing in its way as a Boudin beachscape. We strolled, watched the ducks with affection, the hockey players with contempt. Nick, boy, said Kemp, I need a cup of the bloody national beverage. And that, too, should have warned me. Her mains all drank coffee. So we went to the tea pavilion, stood in a queue, then found half a table. Kemp left me to go to the ladies, I pulled out a paperback I had in my pocket. The couple on the other side of the table moved away. The noise, the mess, the cheap food, the queue to the counter. I guessed Kemp was having to queue also. And I became lost in the book. In the other seat opposite, diagonally from me, so quietly, so simply. She was looking down at the table, not at me. I jerked round, searching for Kemp but I knew Kemp was walking home. She said nothing, waited. All the time I had expected some spectacular re-entry, some mysterious call, a metaphorical, perhaps even literal, descent into a modern Tartarus. And yet, as I stared at her, unable to speak, at her refusal to return my look, I understood that this was the only possible way of return. 
her rising into this most banal of scenes, this most banal of London, this reality as plain and dull as wheat. Since she was cast as reality, she had come in her own, yet in some way heightened, stranger, still with the aura of another world, from, but not of, the crowd behind her. She was wearing a delicate patterned tweed suit, autumn flecked with winter, a dark green scarf tied peasant fashion round her head. She sat with her hands primly in her lap, as if she had done her duty. She was here. Every other move was mine. But now the moment had come I could do nothing, say nothing, think nothing. I had imagined too many ways of our meeting again, and yet none like this. In the end I even stared down at my book, as if I wanted no more to do with her, then angrily up past her at a moronically curious family, seen sniffing faces across the gangway. She did at last give me a little lancing look of only a fraction of a moment, but it caught the face I had really meant for the ones opposite. Without warning she stood and walked away. I watched her move between the tables, her smallness, that slightly sullen smallness and slimness that was a natural part of her sexuality. I saw another man's eyes follow her through the door. I let a few stunned, torn seconds pass, then I gave chase, pushing roughly past the people in my way. She was walking slowly across the grass toward the east. I came beside her, and she gave the bottom of my legs the smallest token glance. Still we said nothing. I felt so caught unawares it was even in our clothes. I had lost all interest in what I wore, how I looked, had taken on the cryptic coloring of Kemp's and Jojo's worlds. Now I felt uncouth beside her and resented it. She had no right to reappear like some close-conscious and self-possessed young middle-class wife. It was almost as if she wanted to flaunt the reversal in our roles and fortunes. I looked round. There were so many people, so many too far to distinguish, and Regent's Park. That other meeting of the young deserter and his love, the scent of lilac and bottomless darkness. Where are they? She gave a little shrug. I'm alone. Like hell. We walked more silent paces. She indicated with her head an empty bench beside a tree-lined path. She seemed as strange to me as if she had indeed come from Tartarus, so cold, so calm. I followed her to the seat. She sat at one end, and I sat halfway along, turned toward her, staring at her. It infuriated me that she would not look at me, had made not the slightest sign of apology, would not say anything. I said, I'm waiting, as I've been waiting these last three and a half months. She untied her scarf and shook her hair free. It had grown again, as when I first knew her, and she had a warm tan. From my very first glimpse of her I realized, and it seemed to aggravate my irritation, that the image idealized by memory of a lily always at her best had distorted Allison into what she was only at her worst. She was wearing a pale brown shirt beneath the suit. It was a very good suit. Conscious must have given her money. She was pretty and desirable even without... I remembered Parnassus, her other selves. She stared down at the tip of her flat-heeled shoes. I looked out over the grass. I want to make one thing clear from the start. She said nothing. I forgive you that foul, bloody trick you played this summer. I forgive you whatever miserable, petty female vindictiveness made you decide to keep me waiting all this time, she shrugged, a silence. Then she said, But? But I want to know what the hell went on that day in Athens, what the hell's been going on since, and what the hell's going on now. And then? We'll see. She took a cigarette out of her handbag and lit it, and then, without friendliness, offered me the packet. I said, no thanks. 
She stared into the distance toward the aristocratic wall of houses that make up Cumberland Terrace and overlook the park, cream stucco, a row of white statues along the cornices, the muted blues of the sky. A poodle ran up to us. I waved it away with my foot, but she patted it on the head. A woman called, Tina, darling, come here. In the old days, we would have exchanged grimaces of disgust. She went back to staring at the houses. I looked round. There were other seats a few yards away, other sitters and watchers. Suddenly the peopled park seemed a stage, the whole landscape, a landscape of maskers, spies. I lit one of my own cigarettes, willed her to look at me, but she wouldn't. Allison. She glanced at me briefly, but then down again, she sat holding the cigarette, as if nothing would make her speak. A plain leaf lolloped down, touched her skirt. She bent and picked it up, smoothed its yellow teeth against the tweed. An Indian came and sat on the far end of the bench, a threadbare black overcoat, a white scarf, a thin face. He looked small and unhappy, timidly alien, a waiter perhaps, the slave of some cheap curry house kitchen, I moved a little closer to her, lowered my voice, and forced it to sound as cold as hers. What about Kemp? Nico, please don't interrogate me. Please don't. My name, a tiny shift, but she was still set hard and silent. Are they watching? Are they here somewhere? An impatient sigh. Are they? No. But at once she qualified it. I don't know. Meaning you do. Still, she wouldn't look at me. She spoke in small, almost a bored voice. It's nothing to do with them now. There was a long pause. I said, you can't lie to me, face to face. She touched her hair, the hair, her wrist, a way she had of raising her face a little as she made the gesture, a glimpse of the lobe of an ear, I had a sense of outrage, as if I was being barred from my own property. You're the only person I've ever felt could never lie to me. Can you imagine what it was like in the summer, when I got that letter, those flowers? She said, If we start talking about the past, all my overtures were in some way irrelevant, she had something else on her mind. My fingers touched a smooth, dry roundness in my coat pocket. A chestnut, a talisman. Jojo had passed it to me, wrapped in a toffee paper. Her pocky joke, one evening in a cinema. I thought of Jojo, somewhere only a mile or two away through the brick and the traffic, sitting with some new pickup, drifting into her womanhood, of holding her pudgy hand in the darkness. And suddenly I had to fight not to take Allison's. I said her name again. But coming to a decision determined to be untouched, she threw the yellow leaf away. I've returned to London to sell the flat. I'm going back to Australia. Long journey for such a small matter. And to see you. Like this? To see if I... But she cut her sentence short. If you? I didn't want to come. Then why are you here? She shrugged. If it's against your will? But she would not answer. She was as mysterious, almost a new woman. One had to go back several steps and start again, and know the place for the first time. As if what had once been free in her, as accessible as a pot of salt on the table, was now held in a vile sacrosanct. But I knew Allison. I knew how she took on the color and character of the people she loved or liked, however independent she remained underneath, and I knew where that smooth impermeability came from. I was sitting with a priestess from the temple of Demeter. I tried to be matter-of-fact. Where have you been since Athens? At home? Perhaps. I took a breath. Have you thought about me at all? Sometimes. Is there someone else? She hesitated, then said, No. You don't sound very certain. 
There's always someone else, if you're looking for it. Have you been looking for it? She said, there's no one. And I'm included in that no one? You've been included in it ever since that day. The sullen profile, that perverse stare into the distance, she was aware of my look and her eyes followed someone who was passing, as if she found him more interesting than me. What am I to do? Take you in my arms? Fall on my knees? What do they want? I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, yes, you damn well do. Her eyes flicked sideways at me, and she looked down. She said, I saw through you that day. That's all. Forever. I made love to you that day. Also, in a sense, forever. I watched her breathe in, as if on a pent-up scorn. Waited for her to say something, anything, even the scorn. Quelled my own growing anger with her. Tried to sound calm. There was a moment on that mountain when I loved you. I don't think you know. I know you know. I saw it. I know you too well not to be sure you saw it too. And remember it, I added. And I'm not talking about bodies. Again, she waited to answer. Why should I remember it? Why shouldn't I do everything I can to forget it? You know the answer to that too. Do I? I said, Allison, don't come closer. Please don't come closer. She would not look at me, but it was in her voice. I had a feeling of trembling too deep to show, as if the brain cells trembled. She spoke with her head turned away. All right, I know what it means. Her face still averted. She took out another cigarette and lit it. Or it meant, when I loved you, it meant everything you said or did to me had meaning, emotional meaning. It moved me, excited me, it depressed me, it made me... She took a deep breath. Like the way after all that's happened, you can sit there in that tea place and look at me as if I'm a prostitute or something, and... It was a shock, for God's sake. I touched her then, my hand on her shoulder, but she shook it off. I had to move closer to hear what she said. Whenever I'm with you, it's like going to someone and saying, Torture me, abuse me, give me hell. Because, Allison, oh, you're nice now. You're nice now, so bloody nice, for a week, for a month, and then we'd start again. She was not crying. I leaned forward and looked. In some way I knew she was acting, and yet not acting. Perhaps she had rehearsed the saying this, but still meant it. As you're going back to Australia anyway, I spoke lightly without sarcasm, but she twisted a glance at me as if my crassness was monstrous. I made the mistake of beginning to smile, of calling her hand. Suddenly she was on her feet. Crossing the path, she walked out under the trees onto the open grass. After a few steps there, she stopped. If it was plausible as a reaction, it was far less as a movement, and especially the stopping. Something about the way she stood, the direction she faced. And then, in a flash, I knew for certain. Beyond her stretched the grass, a quarter mile of turf to the edge of the park. Beyond that rose the Regency facade, bestatued, many and elegantly windowed, of Cumberland Terrace. A wall of windows, a row of statues of classical gods. They surveyed the park as if from a dress circle, and Allison's complicity. She had led me out of the tea pavilion. She had chosen the seat we sat on. Now she stood in full view, waiting for me to join her. But once too often, I got up and went and stood in front of her, my back to the distant buildings. She lowered her eyes. It was not a difficult part to play. That bruised face, very near tears, but not in tears. Now listen, Allison. I know who is watching us. I know where he's watching. I know why we are here. So first, I'm nearly broke. I haven't got a job, and I'm never going to have a job that means anything. Therefore, 
you're standing with the worst prospect in London. Now, second, if Lily walked down that path behind us and beckoned to me, I don't know. The fact that I don't know and probably never shall is what I want you to remember. And while you're about it, remember she isn't one girl, but a type of encounter. I paused a moment. Third, as you kindly told me in Athens, I'm not much good in bed. I didn't say that. I stared at the top of her head and knew behind my own the blank upper windows of Cumberland Terrace, those white stone divinities. Fourth, he said something to me one day about males and females, how we judge things as objects and you judge them by their relationships. All right, you've always been able to see this, whatever it is, between us, joining us. I haven't. That's all I can offer you. The possibility that I'm beginning to see it. Can I speak? No. You now have a choice. And you'd better make it very fast. It's me or them. But either way, for good. You have no right. I have as much right as you did in that hotel room in Greece, which is every right, I added. And for exactly the same reason as you had then. It's not the same thing. Oh, yes, it is. You have my part now. I gestured back toward Cumberland Terrace. They have everything to offer. But I'm like you. I have only one. I can't even blame you if you make my mistake. Think there everything is a much better choice than any future we might have. The only thing is you've got to bet. In their sight. And now. She glanced up at the houses, and I too turned a moment. The afternoon sun made them gleam with light, that Olympian elixir of serene, remote, benign light one sometimes sees in summer clouds. She said as if she rejected both them and me, I'm going back to Australia. I had a sense of an abyss between us that was immeasurably deep, yet also absurdly narrow, as narrow as our real distance apart, crossable in one small step. I stared at her psychologically contused face, her obstinacy, her unmaneuverability. There was the smell of a bonfire. A hundred yards away a blind man was walking, freely, not like a blind man. Only the white stick showed he had no eyes. I began to walk toward the path that led to the south gate home. Two steps, four, six, then ten. Nico! It sounded strangely peremptory, harsh, not in the least conciliatory. I checked momentarily and half looked round, then forced myself to move on. I heard her running, but did not turn, until she was almost up to me. She stopped five or six feet away, breathing a little hard. She wasn't pretending. She was going back to Australia, or at least to some Australia of the mind, of the emotions, to live the rest of her life without me. Yet she wouldn't let me go like this. Her eyes were wounded, outraged. I was more than ever impossible. I took two steps back toward her, raised an angry finger. You still haven't learnt. You're still playing to their script. She held my eyes, returning every degree of my bile. I came back because I thought you'd changed. I do not know why I did what happened next. It was neither intended nor instinctive. It was neither in cold blood nor in hot. But yet it seemed, once committed, a necessary act no breaking of the commandment. My arm flicked out and slapped her left cheek as hard as it could. The blow caught her completely by surprise, nearly knocked her off balance, and her eyes blinked with the shock. Then very slowly she put her left hand to the cheek. We stared wildly at each other for a long moment in a kind of terror. The world had disappeared and we were falling through space, the abyss might be narrow, but it was bottomless. Behind Alice and I could see people stopped on the path. A man stood up from his seat. The Indian sat and watched. Her hand stayed over the side of her face, and her eyes were growing wet, certainly with the pain and perhaps partly also with a sort of incredulity. The final truth came to me as we stood there, 
trembling, searching, between all our past and all our future, at a moment when the difference between fission and fusion lay in a nothing, a tiniest movement, betrayal, further misunderstanding. There were no watching eyes. The windows were as blank as they looked. The theater was empty. It was not a theater. They had perhaps told her it was a theater, and she had believed them, and I had believed her. Perhaps it had all been to bring me to this, to give her my last lesson and final ordeal, the task, as in La Strade, of turning lions and unicorns and magi and other mythical monsters into stone statues. I looked away from Allison and at those distant windows, the façade, the pompous white pedimental figures that crowned it. It was logical, the perfect climax to the god game. They had absconded. We were alone, I was so sure. And yet, after so much, how could I be perfectly sure? How could they be so cold, so inhuman, so incurious? So, load the dice and yet leave the game? I looked back toward the path. The far more natural watchers there were strolling on, as if this trivial little bit of masculine brutality, the promised scene, had lost their interest also. Allison hadn't moved. She still held a hand to her cheek, but now her head was bowed. There was a little shuddered out breath as she tried to stifle the tears, then her voice, broken, hardly audible, in despair, almost... Self-amazed. I hate you. I hate you. I said nothing, made no move to touch her. After a moment she looked up and everything in her expression was as it had been in her voice and words. Hatred, pain, every female resentment since time began. But I clung to something, the something I had never seen or always feared to see. In those intense gray eyes, the quintessential something behind all the hating, the hurtness, the tears, a small step poised, a shattered crystal waiting to be reborn. She spoke again as if to kill what I was looking at. I do. Then why wouldn't you let me walk away? She shook her abruptly lowered head as if the question was unfair. You know why. No. I knew within two seconds of seeing you, I went closer. Her other hand went to her face as if I might hit her again. I understand that word now, Allison, your word. Still she waited, face hidden in her hands, like someone being told of a tragic loss. You can't hate someone who's really on his knees, who'll never be more than half a human being without you the bowed head, the buried face. She is silent. She will never speak. Never forgive, never reach a hand, never leave this frozen present tense. All waits, suspended. Suspend the autumn trees, the autumn sky. Anonymous people, a blackbird, poor fool, sings out of season from the willows by the lake. A flight of pigeons over the houses, Fragments of freedom, hazard, an anagram made flesh, and somewhere the stinging smell of burning leaves. Cross amet quinunquam amabit, quique amabit cross amet.